China Seminar is honored to have as our speaker today, former East West Center President, Richard Volstek. Richard has had a long association with China Seminar, going back to his days as a graduate student at the University of Hawaii. We're grateful for Richard's support and the support of East West Center's insights in maintaining China Seminar online. Uh, Richard, as many of you may know, is in transition. He's joined the uh, Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies as a professor on the faculty. And the new president uh, is in transition as well, uh, uh, Suzanne Perez Lum. She took on the job uh, in January, and we're honored to have her today uh, to uh, do the introduction of Richard's talk. So um, aloha and welcome, Susie. Aloha, Gerald. Aloha, my kako, everyone. What an honor it is to be with all of you and, and to be able to introduce today's speaker, my predecessor, the president of the East West Center, uh, Richard Vilstek, uh, being for actually five weeks now on the job. Um, it really is an honor to stay connected and see the amazing things that Richard continues to do. You know, he has played a key role in keeping alive this wonderful institution of the China Seminar. But any of you who know him, of course, is not surprised by his active support of something that his longtime mentor and friend, Professor Daniel Kwok, established more than 44 years ago. And as Gerald mentioned, Richard was one of the founding members of the seminar in 1978, while a doctoral student here at the University of Hawaii. And though he didn't work directly for Professor Kwok, he did fall under his influence during one of the first American academic tours of the People's Republic of China in 1979, following the change in diplomatic recognition in January of that year. Over the past two years, since we've all been dealing with COVID, we all know this, Richard has worked to provide the support needed to move this seminar that traditionally has been held at the Maple Garden restaurant to a virtual world of Zoom and YouTube where it's flourished beyond anyone's expectations and touched many, many people. So in maintaining the rich legacy, of course, of the China seminar, which is just one of the many things for which I'm grateful to Richard, I, ho I hope and I know that he will remain actively engaged as he moves on to his new journey at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. So thank you for this opportunity to introduce our former president of the East West Center, Dr. Richel, Richard Volstek. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Susie, for that very kind introduction. And um, again, my thanks to the friends of the East West Center for allowing me to once a year usually address the seminar as well as continue now and then with Rick Hornick and others as a moderator for these very important uh, 10 sessions usually a year of the China seminar. I guess given my new position now, I should make it clear up front that everything I'll be saying in the next uh, hour are my own views and do not reflect the East West Center or APCSS in any way. Um, so it's just personal, personal opinion. And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm particularly happy to have the opportunity to do this because when one changes jobs, it's always a time of reflection. Usually I don't reflect with big crowds listening, uh, but in this case, I was, uh, I was asked by uh, the organizers to talk a little bit about how I got where I am, uh, especially on the China studies side of things. And with hopefully that some of the things that I um, experienced and kind of thought through and still thinking through may be relevant for others who are uh, deep into China work or in a broader sense of China globally um, as they try to make sense of contemporary affairs with historical perspective. And so my title, uh, I'm, I'm a little, I hate to, the six decades of China study makes me seem really old. It reminds me uh, when I was at um, uh, a short time at Harvard as a fellow at the East Asian Legal Studies, uh, it was the same semester, it was just the uh, spring semester of 1977, John K. Fairbank really the, the, uh, the, the main person who built China studies really in the United States 
uh, one, of the, one of the few leaders in the early days, uh, it was his last semester teaching at Harvard before he went to full-time writing. And he was at the Harvard club he gave, he was introduced very kindly, uh, kind of like Susie's introduction. And it is also mention was made of his many decades of work in China. And his statement, which I think is maybe appropriate is, I hope he said, I was, when he, after he was introduced, he said, I hope uh, this doesn't mean that I've entered my anecdotage. And so uh, if I have a, a brain freeze uh, during the next 20 minutes or so, um, uh, it's because of my, I have reached my anecdotage, I guess, but I'm hoping to be uh, coherent. So let's get started. And um, uh, I hope that there'll be some things here that you may find uh, a little bit interesting. So next slide, please. This is uh, kind of a, a quick agenda what we're gonna do. Uh, uh, talk about some selected lessons learned. Uh, I know they are selected because of, uh, I've been very fortunate to um, have good mentors and uh, pay attention to things and been in situations where I had to learn lessons, usually by failing at things and learning from them. And then I'll turn to the imagery of foot binding and mind binding for some comments on contemporary issues, not only from my own, not only for just my own thoughts about it, but really setting up um, some uh, next presentations of the China seminar coming up. Uh, so let me get going on this. So, you know, I really started looking at Asia and global things actually, even more than six days, decades ago, uh, I was a stamp collector. And uh, for those of you who were uh, in the old days, the stamp albums uh, would have uh, for each country, a description uh, and a little map of uh, where the place was and some of its history and economic uh, kinds of activity. So very early on, I really got interested in kind of global things um, uh, through stamp collecting. Um, and then as I moved on, of course, I think I was always been interested in maps as well. And I, I realized early on, thanks to some teachers, that it's a good idea to kind of construct a geography of the mind. And that is, how do you take all this disparate information, things you're learning, and give some structure to it? And for me, one of the key, uh, some of the key things to put things in context are physical and economic geography. Uh, you know, know the lay of the land, uh, rivers, lakes, and roads, uh, some, about, uh, some more details about the typography, just how the, how the world is put together. And of course, if you're a historian, um, like there's a lot of change in that. Uh, if you look at say maritime, uh, uh, Southeast Asia maritime history, uh, going back to the very early days of trade routes, um, you know the uh, the uh, ocean was a uh, had a different structure in some respects than the South China Sea. As you know, it's quite shallow, and so it was a very interesting to look at historical things back thousands of years, uh, but also how that physical and economic, you might say, determinism has impact on uh, way countries, societies act. And at the same time, I there's a sense of periodization. Um, I like comparative time charts when I was still teaching University of Hawaii, worked with uh, uh, some really great scholars like John Stefan and Dick Morris and Brian McKnight, and uh, as well as Danny Kwok, of course. And another lecture has always had that kind of a, a timeline and so forth, not just say for Japanese history, but how it interacted with uh, Korean and, and uh, Japanese and other regional histories. And so I remember, um, you know, all the claims of the ancient uh, uh, Chinese civilization that we got to remember that, you know, the first walled city, Jericho, is 5,000 years old, older than the, than the uh, Lungshan culture in China. So it goes way back. I got interested, of course, in uh, Egyptian history, uh, early history, as well as the Mohan Gennaro and Harappan civilizations in Minas Valley. Again, those civilizations in India were about a thousand years before uh, the Shang uh, cities were first coming, coming in, 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 in the play. And then, of course, the people, Confucius and Socrates were roughly contemporaries. And I always remember the first time I found out that, that Karl Marx wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln congratulating him on freeing the slaves. 
you know, just making that association between, you know, European and American history and figures, it, it just, it kind of uh, adds texture, I think, uh, as one tries to develop uh, a specific field of interest, in my case, uh, China, but to put it in context with what else is happening uh, around the globe. And of course, that's what we have to do today as well. And then our third thing for me was I was really interested in the history of ideas, which really followed the trade routes and the growth of cities, especially port cities. And of course, the early history, uh, histories when I was still a student, uh, with the history of warfare and diplomacy. And so the invasion routes and so forth were very important as kind of markers for uh, the way uh, the world has kind of evolved uh, from an analytic point of view. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, so what I've experienced over the decades is, uh, is really, we talk about lifelong learning, but really I, I find that um, it's not just lifelong learning, it's lifelong adjur uh, adjusting uh, course corrections on how you learn and how you integrate things. And that involves both attitudes and assessments. Tone is very, very important. That's something I'll come back to pretty soon. And of course, that's also prompted by diverse reading. I've always been kind of cross-disciplinary and cross-geographic interests, uh, looking for patterns and connectedness and, and eventually how places interoperate. Um, um, and get to getting that through books. So one of the, my, my favorite genres of many is travel narrative. And so even though I have not tromped through uh, the Siberian steppes or I've been to, uh, you know, to uh, Middle, Middle Eastern or Central Asian cities and so forth are so important on the trade routes. I read a lot of books about people traveling there and histories of cities. They give me, a, I kind of feel the texture, you know, the, the, the climate, the people, the religions, and the uh, social structures. And I think those are all kind of given a, a foundation for my thinking as I address contemporary problems. And of course, uh, as we all know, I think what's so key is to have really great mentors and as counselors, coaches, guide. I've had so many over the years that it's, I've just been very, very fortunate. Uh, next. Uh, so, you know, one of the things is watching and listening to people. And one of my advantages has been that I've worked in about seven different sectors, I've been able to see really smart people do things. And there's this kind of a short list of, uh, you might say, besides the book learning and academic stuff, is to really see how people try to deal with social political issues, so, social political issues. And of course, I was a social political philosophy kind of uh, focus in the early days. And so, uh, but the real issue is how do you translate uh, knowledge into action? Become not only a knowledgeable person, uh, but a one who is, uh, can translate that into action. We talk about the Eastwood Center, for example, actionable research. You know, what can you do? You may know a lot about the uh, Pacific Islands, but what do you, you know, how do you can turn that into action, say, on climate change issues or whatever? And so I had this opportunity then across the spectrum here to work in depth with a lot of different uh, sectors uh, uh, that you can see in front of you here. And I must say this in, in the end of this slide is I think uh, invariably international business people are vastly underrated players when it comes to uh, trying to understand how things work and don't work uh, uh, locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned, I mentioned mentors, and I wanna say that, um, this focus on four people because they've had a real influence on, I would say, ongoing um, kind of my geography of mine as I try to and as I move to a new job, to try to get my mind around uh, what APCS is doing when it looks at the region, at the, uh, especially Indo-Pacific region, and uh, how what I know and think and my attitudes uh, can be of, uh, of salient and of, of important use. And so I remember we had, uh, those who are better at Eastwood Center or in the University of Hawaii for a while, or may remember in the 1970s, we were honored to have Joseph Needham, you know, the... Uh, the writer of the, uh, actually inventor, you might say, and started the huge uh, 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 multi-volume project on science and civilization in, in China. And um, 
I actually, uh, he was here with Lou Wei Jun, his, his, uh, his uh, eventual wife, but uh, lover and uh, had a kind of interesting, interesting uh, eccentric lifestyle. Joseph Needham, you could read uh, um, Simon Winchester's book on, on his biography, right? Quite interesting. But uh, Needham, uh, I, had, I was asked to be his chauffeur and drive him around sightseeing for two days, he and Lou Wei Jun. And I can tell you, it was my first experience of, of just an incredible genius, an insatiable curiosity. It was like driving around a bus load of curious children with those two in the car. Uh, but in this presentation he gave at the university, one of the questions he was asked was, well, how do you, you know, how do you handle such a huge writing project like an encyclopedia of science and, and civilization in China? And I thought he had a, just a terrific answer. Well, first of all, you put down uh, a table of contents. <laughs> so basically, look at the big picture, subdivide it into bite-sized pieces, and get on with it. And I thought, you know, every time I feel overwhelmed, like in a sense I do at APCSS, all things I have to learn, I, I think of Joseph Needham. I say, look, get your table of contents of things you got to do and start, get on with it piece by piece. And eventually, you know, you'll get to be able to handle it. And as you move and, and the pieces start to add up, then you can recorrect, you can correct course and re reflect and so forth. That was great advice and a reminder of, uh, I think a lot of people have writing blocks or performative blocks because they just seem overwhelmed by the task. Nothing like, nothing better than have a table of contents and do two to-do lists and get on it. So I, I'm always in debt with, with Needham's comment because really, I was struggling with my dissertation at the time, which seemed like an endless task. Um, James Lilly, many of you may know him as ambassador both to the uh, Republic of China when it was still uh, uh, before uh, uh, the, the separation of mainland and, and, and uh, Taiwan and also was ambassador to PRC. Um, and after of course, long history at the at the uh, uh, CIA and on then in, in the um, in, in in the State Department. Then he went to AEI, uh, uh, think tank in Washington. And I always took groups when I was running chambers of commerce in Taiwan and Hong Kong to go, especially while well, excuse me in, in in Taiwan before he passed away, uh, to meet with him. And one day I had a one on one conversation with him, and it was a really important one. I said, you know, you've been very very successful, sir, and dealing constructively with the Chinese Communist Party. And you know, a lot of people will kind of flip back and forth on their foundational understanding. What's their, their analytic stance? What is your, your core understanding of the CCP that gives you such consistency? And he says, Richard, Richard, if you want to understand the Chinese Communist Party and how it operates, reread The Godfather. They're all thugs. And I thought, whoa, that's kind of strong. But then I realized, yes, the idea of a single leader, omerta, loyalty, uh, how to deal with people who disagree with you in a rather uh, summary ways and so forth, pretty much summarizes how the Communist Party has worked for the centers and so forth, as well as organizationally. So I thought it was a real insight. And uh, But I also want to add to that comment that Jim Lilly did not, you know, slip into vapid rhetoric about, you know, good guys and bad guys and so forth. It was look what the facts are, shine sun, you know, give sunlight to it. Here's the way they operate. Here's what they do. Here's how they do it, and uh, uh, you know, kind of stay engaged as we would, uh, as Americans, for example, to continue to interact with various uh, periods of Chinese leadership over the decades. And then when I was at Harvard Law School as a uh, East Asian Legal Studies as a, as, a, as a visiting fellow, I was actually pretty young. I was more of a research guy, I think. But anyway, um, I had a course, took a course from Jerry at, at in the law school, which is on cross-strait relations and China, generally speaking, China law course. And one of the things he said, the other course, if this is 1977, if anyone, uh, if anyone, uh, can solve the cross-strait 
situation, you get an automatic A in the course. Now, Jerry is 92 years old, still lecturing at New York University Law School at 92, and no one's got that A yet. We're still, uh, some topics seem forever intractable, and a lot of problems are like that when you're an analyst. His advice was, again, stick with it, get your facts straight, be dispassionate in your analysis, realize whether we like an institution or we like a country or we like what's going on, we've got to be engaged in a constructive, transparent way to operate on our own principles. And that has been very, very important to me. And, and quite similarly, uh, Danny Kwok, uh, uh, working with him over the years, is saying the same thing. I thought it brings all these together. You're always trying to sharpen your perspectives with study, integrate what you learn, uh, do tangential things which carry a lot of weight. You know, Danny only a few years ago wrote a book on, on understanding China through, uh, through uh, Chinese gardens, which is really insightful. So they've got little things you can do that carries a big picture. And so from these, these are just four examples uh, of wise advice that I think are, I still apply. And I'm applying as I speak, as I start my new job. Next. And so, you know, this, this is a quick list of things that, that really, uh, when I was on my business experience about uh, lessons learned, for those of you who've done anything with business with China, I think you'll see uh, a lot of things here are familiar. Uh, just the, la uh, the last things, last three, I think I'll just focus on this. One of the advice was, when you're an, anal analyst, an analyst, pay attention to those who are not getting attention, whether it's institutions or people. It's very, very important. Uh, the marginalized people, uh, sometimes have much more to offer uh, for, to an analyst who's doing the work. And then of course, read the documents, pay attention to what the party says it's going to do because it will. And then of course, the suffering thing of China study, especially in the, in, in the CCP era, is trying to deal with the horrible syntax and, and thought patterns and way of writing of Chinese documents and announcements and speeches. Uh, it is really like swimming through wet sand sometimes. And one of the, one of the uh, it's, uh, it's been always for me decades of just uh, trying to, to make sense of the three represents and all these other sorts of things that just, you know, were def the, actually designed actually to, to stop thought instead of encourage it. In fact, that takes me to the last part of what I want to say this morning, uh, which is really going back to the title of my speech. Uh, next slide, please. And that is this image of, uh, uh, of between foot binding and what I call mind binding. Mind binding. Now, I wrote a piece a long time ago when I was still a student um, on, on foot binding, just it's interesting, a sideline and the impact on social issues and so forth. And we all know that uh, for going clear back to actually uh, to the song for sure, uh, so a thousand years, it was foot binding was uh, seen as uh, something that made women more beautiful and attractive. And there is the jury is out on how long, uh, how many, what percentage of the female population actually went through the pain and suffering of having their bones or fit broken and, and so they to form the lotus feet. Uh, but these things are what the results of foot binding. For the women who had bound feet, it was pain and suffering reduce movement, deform gait, restricted opportunities, and a guaranteed subordinate role for women. And I think about that, next slide, please. I see direct parallels between when you look at Chinese rhetoric on what is allowed as far as constructive discussion of criticism, of interactive, uh, uh, whether it's in a conference or in the newspapers or in magazines, or uh, big posters or whatever uh, on, the, on the wall that the goal of the, of the Chinese Communist Party has been to bind the minds, to restrict uh, creativity and the ability to express oneself without uh, uh, fear of retribution. Very much like the Godfather and very much uh, uh, in evidence as we watch what's happening in Hong Kong, which we'll hear more about in the next China seminar. But just think for a second. The pay, when look at the, I'm reading the Hong Kong uh, uh, thing in particular because I spent time there and it's, it's so discouraging to see how things have changed so rapidly. But the, the physical and psychological 
stress of being able to have a free and open discussion, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and they have that circumstance. It is painful. And my friends I talk to are suffering psychologically from this extra. Reduced movement. You can't go to conferences overseas. We saw the Eastwood Center. Um, it's dangerous. Uh, people are being restricted because they may do something wrong. Uh, you know, a Chinese tennis player has retired, so she can't go overseas to international tournaments and talk about the issue that she had, which would be embarrassed the party. The party. So reduced movement uh, for uh, assembly, for example, domestically and internationally. And that has a, when you have a lack of content, it cripples your mental, your mental capabilities. You're not being challenged. The gadfly thing, I, like I mentioned with, a, with, a, uh, with the uh, mentors. If you're not challenged intellectually, you become lazy intellectually, and that's crippling. If you restrict the networks with whom you can interact, people who are like, like thinkers, but people who are, who are not like thinkers, again, your opportunities for constructive thought are seriously restricted. And that means that we're seeing a whole generation of thinkers, artists, uh, social commentators, uh, media and so forth, who are being marginalized by what's happening with the control of discourse in civil society in China, and now in Hong Kong. Not new. Those who know Chinese history know this has happened repeatedly. Uh, and what's interesting about this list, the little dots are, there's more I could have here, but the, the real interesting thing here is that if you're, if you're a Chinese in China, or, or now a, a young Chinese kid in Hong Kong, none of these things are gonna be in your history. These have been airbrushed out or so, uh, so anodyne is to be innocuous. So the study of Chinese history in China is very much like it was the study of, of Russian history in the old Soviet Union uh, is very, very circumscribed. And I would say it suggests in China, the way things are evolving is even more circumscribed than the authoritarian state uh, in Russia today. And now we're seeing the Hong Kong reforms happening, which is following out the same pattern that we saw with the restrictions and these other earlier episodes of Chinese Communist Party history. Next, please. And so, you know, these things about uh, the rhetorical toolbox that were domestic issues, you know, uh, seek out and destroy. And that's what they're saying, a struggle against those who would, within China, who would challenge the social system by introducing bourgeois liberalization, capitalist influences, Western democracy, ideas of free press, assembly, and so forth. The party is never wrong. Of course, the party is never consistent. It keeps rewriting its history, so it's not wrong. And of course, anybody who points that out, of course, will hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, which really means hurt the challenge the Chinese Communist Party leadership. And so what's next slide, please. So we're seeing the same domestic rhetorical toolbox is now in action internationally. And again, uh, next month, you will see more details about the Hong Kong event, uh, event but I would suggest to you that this mind binding is already well underway globally. Uh, people who write in media, whether it's Australia, United States, or wherever, uh, critically uh, in newspapers or magazines are gonna hear about their publishers or advertisers are gonna hear about it. Uh, we've seen the university campuses issues, uh, especially universities who've taken a lot of Chinese money uh, uh, that they are circumscribed who can bring to campus and so forth. Um, the same thing on uh, having, that's supposed to be access, sorry, uh, conferences and travel and so forth has, thank you, um, uh, is, has also uh, uh, been affected because sometimes the access you give to people are there to stop discussion, not to contribute to it. So there's a lot of co-opting and co coercions across not just the United States, but internationally of the, uh, uh, the party's outreach not only to overseas Chinese and, and uh, people on the Chinese payroll, so to speak, but really uh, through various coercive modes. And I think one of the things, again, as I go back to one of the first slides, one of the most important things we can do as analysts in Chinese studies is to put some sunlight on these activities and not say, oh, well, it's more of the same and just forget about it. There's gotta be front page, second page, third page reporting all the time, because we are facing you know, the U.S. says a competition between two versions of society. One's authoritarian, one is free and open societies. 
Uh, but the China version is it's not a competition, it's a struggle. This idea of struggle, this Yo uh, Zheng, is really got a long history to it. And they see a winner, not a, a, a competition where you know, a, everybody gets a, a piece of the pie and you know, gets along. So I think uh, the tone that we have to have as analysts is not to be rhetorically dismissive or anti-China or whatever, but to be analytic about what is happening and make sure what is happening gets good press, especially the counter the disinformation that the Chinese uh, uh, are so effective at doing, not only domestically, but internationally. And so I'm trying to do that now in my new job as I was a bit useful some as well. And um, I hope that, uh, you know, my little path to this superficial thing may be uh, useful for your own thinking, but if not, uh, thanks for listening anyway, and I'll be glad to take any questions.